Good everyone and welcome to the second gecko session of 2024 and the first that um, uh, devoted to pathology in particular hepatic um, pathology foundation of sub-Saharan Africa in conjunction with Project ECHO, the University of New Mexico and are held weekly uh, 4.30 South African Central Time. Uh, the chat will be open for questions and uh, this afternoon the session is devoted to the normal pathology uh, the normal uh, pathology of the liver and will be host and will be presented by uh, martin hale thanks very much martin right uh, good afternoon everyone thanks uh, thanks very much chris and thanks very much for asking me to to give uh, this talk so it was suggested that um, as there are probably a number of new fellows and and uh, people undertaking subspecialization uh, in gastrointestinal pathology that I uh, give a talk, which I gave a couple of years ago uh, um, on the normal microanatomy of the liver. Um, because the understanding of the normal microanatomy is, uh, is fundamental to understanding uh, liver pathology. And um, initially many, many people find the understanding of liver pathology uh, pretty daunting, uh, not from not uh, least um, uh, physicians or surgeons, uh, but also particularly the uh, anatomical pathology registrars. But uh, once you understand the microanatomy, um, then it's uh, relatively easy uh, to understand any pathological processes that are going on. And in fact, it's one of the things that really forms the foundation of the approach to any liver biopsy that we that we see, right? So we're going to start off then, and uh, that is the screen. You should be able to uh, to see that. Uh, am I right? Yes, we can. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I must also just warn you that there is a a transplant that is about to happen, uh, and I'm doing the frozen section on the. Uh, on the liver. So if I suddenly dry up for a few minutes, uh, I will excuse myself uh, briefly, but uh, the section will be brought up to me and I will will just need to, to have a look at it. All right, so uh, the first thing then, as I said, is the uh, pathology of the, um, of the liver. Right, so the first and most important thing is understanding where the liver uh, sits. And as you know, it sits in the right hypochondrium of the uh, of the abdomen, immediately uh, beneath the diaphragm, and uh, in close proximity to the heart. And uh, that really is important from the point of view uh, of these pathologies, because you know often if there is pathology in the lung or pathology in the uh, pleural space, that in fact may also have an impact on the liver. But uh, recognizing that the um, let me just change this, see if I can change my pointer. So that's not that big. Uh, there's a pointer, right, there we are, that's better. Okay, so can everybody see the laser pointer? So uh, you've got the left lobe of the liver, which is the smaller lobe, and the right lobe, which is obviously larger. And depending on the on the pathology and where it's situated, one or, mo or both lobes may be enlarged. Right, that's a, a NETA diagram, which uh, is really a classic diagram showing you the anatomical relationships uh, of the liver. You've got the anterior view, the inferior view, the posterior view, and, uh, and so on. And uh, the important uh, point of this really is to demonstrate to you uh, the critical part of the of the anatomy of the liver, and that is in the region of the porta hepatis. And why is that important? Because if you get pathology in the region of the porta hepatis, it can have a dramatic effect uh, on uh, on the actual liver pathology itself. And in fact, a case which uh, I've just been seeing in the last couple of days, uh, there was a significant um, portal pyelopathy. Uh, from a patient who had a uh, long-standing uh, cholestatic uh, liver disease, and in fact, portal hypertension, uh, secondary to schistosomiasis. And the effect of that, in fact, 
was to have a dramatic secondary knock-on effect uh, on the biliary system. So the portal system then, at least the porta hepatis, plays a vital part uh, in the determination of uh, potential knock-on pathology. All right, so this is uh, what the normal liver looks like, and um, uh, I always uh, refer to this as supermarket liver. If you go to the, um, if you go to any supermarket and have a look at the meat counter, you will see what the normal liver looks like. And importantly, look at the color, look at the architecture, and these are large uh, biliary, uh, these portal tracts. These are the um, triads, um, which you can which would obviously include the bile duct, the portal vein, and the hepatic arteriole. And this, I think, is probably the portal vein. Here you can see, I think, probably a combination of the hepatic arterioles uh, and, the, and the bile duct. But I'd like you to pay specific attention to the consistency and the color of the liver. So it's a reddish brown in color, and it has a smooth consistency. Right, so having looked at that and the macroscopic pathology, now let's look at the microanatomy. And uh, this is the classic lobule. Um, and over the years, there have been various adaptations of this lobular structure. But I think that this uh, is the typical lobule. It's drawn from a Robbins and Cotron's book. And uh, you can see that uh, at the center of the lobule, you've got the central vein. And then at the periphery, you have the uh, triads, the portal tracts, where the portal vein is represented, the hepatic artery is represented, and the bile duct is represented. Now, connecting these structures up, uh, you've got the sinusoidal network. So let's just spend a little bit of time talking about this. So the blood flow into the liver is through two sources, the hepatic artery, which is pictured in red, and the portal vein, which is pictured in blue. So automatically, one can see that the blood supply to the liver is not entirely arterial. So to a certain extent, it is already compromised from the point of view of the oxygen content of that blood. So the blood then mixes from the portal vein and the hepatic arteriole. It mixes in the sinusoidal network and it passes down the sinusoids and eventually arrives at the central vein and uh, exits the liver from the central vein. The bile flow, on the other hand, exits in the opposite direction. So it, it bile flows through the biliary canaliculi and it goes along the biliary canaliculi and gradually gains access to the bile duct and exits the liver through the uh, common bile duct into the small bowel through the uh, through the common hepatic, uh, at least through the common common bile duct and common hepatic duct uh, into the into the duodenum. So, when we look at the biliary flow, what we have here, as I said, you've got the arterial supply, you've got the venous supply, and all draining into the central vein. And we this enables us to divide the zones of the of the lobule into three. You've got zone one, which is adjacent to the portal tract, and you've got zone three, which is adjacent or surrounds the central vein. And then we have zone two, which is in the middle. So why is this important? Well, it's important because the hepatocytes that are situated in zone three are at the end of the line when it comes to the supply of nutrients and also to oxygen. So the hepatocytes in zone three then are particularly vulnerable to any insult, whatever that may be, be it a toxic insult, be it a vascular insult. So if, for example, a patient has an episode of severe hypotension, so for example, Let's take a patient who may be involved, say, in a road traffic accident or suffer a major traumatic injury, which results in extreme or severe loss of blood. The patient may undergo laparotomy, uh, may undergo resuscitation. And then some days afterwards, the uh, attending physician or surgeon may notice 
that there has been an elevation in the transaminases or the liver enzymes in general in that particular patient. That patient may then be subjected to a liver biopsy to understand what is going on in the liver. And then when we have a look at it, what we see is we see perivalent necrosis. And what has happened is that there has been ischemic necrosis as a result of that hypotensive episode. And nine times out of 10, if the patient has been uh, adequately resuscitated, in fact, that, uh, that hepatocyte necrosis will, re will reverse. Uh, the necrotic hepatocytes will be eliminated. You'll get regeneration taking place and the liver will return to normal. The same thing may also happen uh, with toxic insults. So let's talk briefly about a common, uh, a common hepatotoxin, and that's paracetamol. So we see many children, for example, who uh, accidentally acquire <clears throat> or acquire, get access to paracetamol. Uh, they take uh, too many tablets or too much in the in the way of the um, uh, of the um, of the paracetamol um, uh, pediatric syrup. Uh, and remember that we all know that there's a fine line between the therapeutic dose of paracetamol and the toxic or the hepatotoxic dose of paracetamol. And because these hepatocytes, as I said, are sitting in the in zone three, it is these hepatocytes that once again are particularly vulnerable uh, to, um, uh, to that toxic injury. So if a patient, for example, a drug-induced liver injury, for example, secondary to, um, secondary to paracetamol, typically you once again also get perivenular hepatocyte necrosis. Now, depending on the toxic dose and that has been taken in by the patient, if it is relatively small, then that toxic dose may just result in the hepatocyte necrosis in zone three. But if it is more extensive and more severe, then in fact that necrosis may extend to zone two. And if it is really severe, it may extend into zone one. So the level of injury, of hepatocyte injury, really dictates how many zones of the liver are involved. So there's a diagrammatic, uh, at least a continuation of that uh, diagrammatic form. And here you can see that what we've got is a portal tract there. We've got the bile duct there. Uh, you've got the portal vein there. You can't see the hepatic arteriole, but it's probably there. It could be buried in that. And then here you've got the central vein. Now, it's not often that one actually sees uh, this uh, level or this accurate detail in histology, because obviously uh, the liver is, you've got to see it in a, in a 3D type of picture. Uh, so sometimes one infers that you're looking at zone three, because this is zone one around the portal tract, and you're seeing the pathology in the century, uh, the perivenular uh, central zones. So one infers that you're looking at zone three. So this is zone three. And notice that even in this particular liver, there is an element of cholestasis, which is happening in zone three. So this patient probably has some degree of cholestatic uh, liver problem. But here you can see you've got intracanalicular, at least intracellular cholestasis in the hepatocytes in zone three. Zone two is okay, and zone one is fine. So a very good example of the microanatomy representation of that diagram in the previous slide. Right, so this is uh, a three-dimensional picture. And here you've got the portal tracts here, and you can see the trabecular arrangement uh, and the blood flows from the hepatic artery and the portal vein uh, into the through the sinusoids into the central vein. So now what about the overview of the liver disease in general? Well, this is vast, and uh, it ranges from congenital causes through metabolic and chemical causes, infectious causes. Good example, in fact, is a case of hepatitis A that we had uh, just a, a short while ago. Once again, uh, there was extensive panzonal necrosis, formal necrosis in a five-year-old child, and... Um, that patient ended up with liver transplantation. 
autoimmune hepatitis is a common disease, particularly in our uh, in in women. And uh, then, of course, you've also got obstructive disease, whether that be as a result of um, uh, venous obstruction to the central vein venous outflow obstruction. Uh, and that takes two forms, a venoocclusive disease or sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, as it's now called, and uh, the larger but Chiari type of picture. You can also get obstructive causes to the to the bile duct, <clears throat> such as primary sclerosing cholangitis. Uh, uh, bile duct tumors uh, can cause uh, biliary obstruction in the liver. And then neoplastic causes, uh, such as, as I've mentioned, um, a tumor in the common bile duct, such as uh, situated at the at the bifurcation, um, the so-called um, Klatskin tumor. But you can also get local tumors in the actual liver itself, be they primary, such as occurring with secondary to hepatocellular carcinoma or metastatic disease. Now, when you get pathological changes taking place in the liver, one of the first things that happens is that you get uh, fatty change. And the steatosis that occurs comes about as a result of the liver cell's inability to transport fat. And um, that fat may take the form of either large droplet steatosis or small droplet steatosis. Now, some of you will remember that in the old days, we called this macrovesicular steatosis and microvesicular steatosis. And those two terms should no longer be used. And the reason why they should no longer be used is because of the confusion that surrounds microvesicular steatosis. Now, microvesicular steatosis, typically in the old days, formed two distinct groups. Excuse me, it formed one group that, um, for example, was the initiation of fatty liver disease, such as alcohol. Uh, and then eventually those small droplets then coalesced to form large droplets, which we call macrovesicular. The problem is that the term microvesicular, we also use that for metabolic disease, such as um, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, um, uh, um, drugs, uh, drug-induced uh, disease, such as uh, tetracycline, and so on and so forth. Acute fatty liver disease was probably uh, the most uh, important one, because typically what happens, oh, the other one is Ray's syndrome. Uh, Ray's syndrome uh, can also cause so-called microvesicular steatosis, secondary to metabolic dysfunction. So what we've done is we've reserved the term microvesicular steatosis now to imply that there is metabolic fatty liver disease. And we've taken out small droplet steatosis and large droplet steatosis, separated those out, and now use the term small droplet steatosis and large droplet steatosis to indicate um, fatty change that occurs as a result of other diseases that is not associated with typical um, metabolic dysfunction in the liver. So in true microvesicular steatosis, the cytoplasm of the hepatocyte has a foamy appearance. And a good way of looking at it is to say that the vacuoles are far too numerous to count in the cytoplasm of the hepatocyte. And what happens is that true small droplet steatosis, you get small droplets of fat that typically surround the nucleus and they then ultimately coalesce and they form large droplet steatosis. Now, initially, the steatosis is usually zonal and uh, the, um, it's present in zone three. The cause of this steatosis or fatty change is usually uh, many, many, many causes. So this then is what the fatty liver looks like. So here you've got the supermarket liver with this reddish brown appearance. And then you've got this typical uh, fatty yellowish color which is characteristic of a fatty liver. 
And histologically, you can see what it looks like. You can see that you've got these large droplets and an admixture with small droplets, and that's a typical appearance. So this is a really florid fatty liver, uh, which is present in a patient. And this could be, for example, in a patient who has severe alcoholic liver disease, has severe um, um, metabolic-associated steatohepatitis. And there again, these terms are starting to become a little bit uh, confusing because the Association of Liver Disease, the American Association of Liver Disease, and Chris Papps, you could comment on that. But in some ways, when we talk about metabolic-associated um, liver disease, that we're talking about the metabolic syndrome. So we've got to be careful that there is no overlap uh, between the metabolic dysfunction that occurs with... <laughs> oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. <laughs> metabolic dysfunction. Let me just catch my breath. Okay, so um, there you got the fatty change. And Chris, as I was saying, I think the fact that the American Association of Liver Diseases introduced this term of metabolic associated liver disease also creates a, another aspect of confusion uh, because of the entities such as uh, Ray's syndrome. <clears throat> right, so, so that is uh, fatty liver. You can get this with uh, steatosis. Um, let's do this again. Right, so the large and small droplet steatosis, uh, secondary to, for example, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Right, so let's talk now about hepatitis. So hepatitis then uh, is a bit of a generic term, and all it means is inflammation of the liver. It can be acute or chronic, but it is important to remember that it's a generic term. So we could talk about viral hepatitis, we could talk about alcoholic hepatitis, we could talk about autoimmune hepatitis. So to use the term hepatitis without an appropriate descriptor is really not a useful way of approaching it. I think the other problem as well is that the public often talk about they had hepatitis or they were jaundiced. Drug-induced liver injury is also a very important cause of drug-induced hepatitis, and we see this on at least a regular basis, probably once a week, uh, where patients present with drug-induced liver injury. <clears throat> but remember, drugs, toxins, remember that drugs are, are also um, a toxin, alcohol, of course, and viruses. Now, necrosis often accompanies hepatitis, and there are various patterns of necrosis. In acute disease, you get lobular inflammation and necrosis, and uh, that can either be spotty, it can be confluent necrosis, for example, just around zone three, or it can be massive or submassive necrosis. And that really all depends whereabouts in the liver, in the liver zone or the liver lobule that it is situated. In chronic disease, once you get chronicity, you start to see interface inflammatory activity accompanied by what we call, used to call piecemeal necrosis. Um, piecemeal necrosis is a good term, and we still use it to a certain extent. And it, it's a good term because it describes exactly what is happening. So piecemeal necrosis, you get inflammation that extends from the lobule into zone one and gradually eliminates or causes spotty necrosis in zone one. And we call that piecemeal. And it comes from the term, uh, basically, uh, 
how do you eat a meal? And for example, if you take a loaf of bread, you don't eat a loaf of bread all at once. You may in fact uh, bite, the, at least not bite, uh, break off a small piece of the, of that bread or loaf uh, and, and eat that. And that's what the term piecemeal means. Typically, when you have piecemeal necrosis, that then can become more extensive and result in bridging necrosis. So this is what uh, we are talking about now with the evidence of, um, of acute hepatitis. So what happens is that you get the portal-based inflammatory infiltrate. You often get a bioductular reaction as well. And uh, you get spotty necrosis in the parenchyma with lymphocytes and uh, histiocytes. You can get fatty change that is present in the parenchyma. And you get, as a result of this change, you also get cellular apoptosis or cell death. And apoptosis can be multiple, in other words, several cells, or it can be individual cells. The other thing that also happens is that you get degenerative changes taking place in the liver cells. That's often a feature of alcohol. We call that ballooning degeneration. And then because you've got a paracellular injury, you may also get cholestasis as well. So this is the typical picture then that you get with, um, with, uh, with acute hepatitis. Now, there are some particular features that are characteristic to individual diseases. So, for example, the inflammatory infiltrate in the portal tract in autoimmune hepatitis is often rich in plasma cells. With hepatitis C infection, you may get an infiltrate or you may get fairly extensive uh, cholestatic change, at least um, fatty change occurring uh, in the liver as well as the hepatocyte necrosis. And then in alcohol, as I said, uh, you may get ballooning degeneration. The other thing that also happens with hepatitis A is that you may also get significant numbers of plasma cells associated with hepatitis A infection. And that may be a way of separating out hepatitis A infection, acute hepatitis A infection from acute hepatitis B infection. The presence of plasma cells also suggests that autoimmune hepatitis may have to be considered. And in fact, there is a relationship morphologically and also clinically and biochemically and serologically with hepatitis A infection and autoimmune disease. And certainly in some patients, uh, with hepatitis A infection, you may also get immune dysregulation and false positive uh, serology for the hepatitis, the acute, sorry, not the acute, the autoimmune markers. <laughs> now, in chronic hepatitis, this is the picture that you get. So if we just remember this here, so I just want you to take in your, in your minds, in your visual cortex, take a photograph of that slide, and then compare it with this. So in chronic hepatitis, what happens is that that piecemeal necrosis that you saw earlier on uh, then starts to become more chronic. And in fact, what happens is that you then get bridging necrosis between portal tracts and central veins. And you may also get bridging between portal tracts and portal tracts. In chronic hepatitis B, for example, you may start to see ground glass hepatocytes those are typical because of the surface antigen positivity in the cytoplasm. You may still see spotty necrosis of hepatocytes because of the accompanying um, inflammatory change that's present in the lobules. And you may also see continuing fatty change. But the difference between chronic hepatitis and acute hepatitis is this bridging that starts to take place. I know that there are also uh, clinical uh, um, um, definitions of uh, merging, well, of the distinction of separation from chronic hepatitis, at least from acute hepatitis to chronic hepatitis, for example, in patients with, uh, with uh, hepatitis B, um, the requirement is that the patients have to have abnormal liver function for a period of six months. But, um, and that, that is important to remember as well. Okay, so that's chronic hepatitis. 
And when we look at some of the histology again, you can see this is a patient with acute hepatitis. And here you can see that we've got um, uh, we've got evidence of a spotty inflammation, this sort of thing here and there, few inflammatory cells there, few inflammatory cells there. These hepatocytes are all right, but in fact, what is happening in these hepatocytes, you can see that there's some intracellular cholestasis and intracellular bile that is now starting to accumulate. So that's acute hepatitis. So what are some of the other symptoms of acute hepatitis from a histological point of view? So this is the pass positive um, diastase stain. And uh, here you can see steroid pigment, which is accumulating in copper cells. So you can see that there, you can see it there, you can see it there. So these copper cells are slightly redder than the surrounding hepatocytes. And you can see that here as well. And this is actually a patient who had INH toxicity uh, and um, uh, is uh, an example of drug-induced liver injury causing acute hepatitis. So what I'd like to point out to you is the relative preservation of the hepatic parenchyma. But if we look at this one here, uh, you can see also INH. You can see that um, here we've got a... Um, just looking to see, this is a central vein here. And you can see that you've got extensive perivenular necrosis. Remember I said that it is in zone three that you get maximal injury in drug-induced liver injury because, and for fact, any hepatocyte injury because of the, um, because of the, uh, the um, susceptibility of hepatocytes in zone three to any cause of liver injury. This is zone one. Well, this is a portal tract. And what you've got in zone one, the cellular proliferation that's taking place is in fact bioductular reaction. And I mentioned that on the previous slide. And what happens is that the stem cells, in fact, are present in the biliary epithelium. So whenever you get liver injury, you always get bioductular proliferation. And that's a mark of the regenerative um, capability of the liver. And that's always uh, uh, puts liver at least um, uh, anatomical pathology registrars off because they look at this and they say there is a bile duct problem without recognizing, in fact, that there's confluent necrosis which is taking place in the liver. So as soon as you see this with the bile ductual injury, very important not to fall into the trap. That trap is also accentuated by the fact that there's usually quite severe cholestasis. So here is a um, the um, mass on trichrome, and you can see that there's early fibrosis. That's this blue-green color, which is taking place in this liver. So there's a higher power magnification of that. And here you can see the structures in the portal tract. You can see the hepatic arteriole there, the hepatic arteriole there, there's two arteries. There's the bile duct, and here you've got the portal <coughs> vein. But what I want to show you is zone one. And here you can see you've got extensive necrosis. There are no viable hepatocytes visible in this particular field. Instead, what we have is we have this florid bile ductular proliferation. And you can see these angulated cells that uh, represent the proliferating bile ducts. And at the periphery, I'm not sure, I hope you can see it, but down here, you've got a few hepatocytes that are, uh, are forming as a result of the stem cell metaplasia that is occurring uh, in this lobule. So what we've got is florid bile ductular proliferation with stem cell metaplasia and the um, birth, if you will, as of, uh, of new hepatocytes. So this liver is regenerating as a result of massive necrosis of the liver. Right, so this is a section then of the reticulin stain. And um, the reticulin here, this is zone one. And you can see that there is collapse in zone one. But here you can see that there is preservation of the reticulin architecture. It is a little bit um, disorganized uh, because of the 
florid bioductal and proliferation. But what is happening is that the in in this area here, uh, you've got um, you've got collapse, and uh, here you've got regeneration, which is taking place. So what I want to really just go through with you now is to demonstrate, for example, in these foci of collapse that you've got here, I'd like you to think of just the ordinary common or garden sponge. Okay, the one that you have in bathrooms and kitchens and probably wash your car with and that sort of thing. So if you take an ordinary sponge and compress it, what you're doing is you're compressing the air. Uh, excuse me a second, I'm going to have to stop, stop here briefly and look at this frozen section. So I'll take about five minutes. Chris, I don't know if you want to just take yeah, I mean, if anyone wants to post any questions um, while we take this break or unmute and ask anything. I mean, it's very seldom that you have such expert pathology from a hepatic pathologist. I mean, the problem is with hepatic pathology is that the nuances and subtleties are so important in differentiating the new condition, the various um, pathological It really becomes uh, such a fulfilling um, experience to um, go through these sessions with him. We have a, um, a 2.30 um, path session uh, every Wednesday, where Martin presents all the cases that come to the Vitzdonal Gordon Hospital and the liver transplantation centre. So we're exposed to a lot of um, hepatic pathology, and really, it makes the clinical, um, you know, the clinical uh, uh, side so much m more fulfilling when you have this expert pathology, and also the liver gives its itself to clinico-pathological co um, correlations so so beautifully that you really need the the expert pathologist on the other line and we're very fortunate to have it um, with Martin. So we'll just take a break until Martin does his frozen section. I mean, this is something we could ask Martin at the end. Um, I remember when f liver fibrous scans first emerged, there was a big concern that it would replace um, hepatic pathologists, and it hasn't. Um, now with artificial intelligence and deep neural networks and machine learning, there's a threat that this might replace pathologists. But I think pathology... Um, Certainly, hepatic pathologists have survived all these threats and probably will also survive artificial intelligence. But it's a very exciting uh, field that we're moving into. And uh, I think it will certainly complement, artificial intelligence will complement um, hepatic uh, pathology reporting. So... Um, there's a question from Bar Adesi in Lagos. Thank you for this great opportunity. Do you have a virtual component of you? Yeah, I mean, I'll have to ask um, Martin whether he, whether he would open it up. It is a um, it is a small session of those clinicians and pathologists that that are involved with the Vitz Donald Gordon um, liver uh, uh, liver service. But certainly, if 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 we can open it up, we will. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss it with Martin and Bilal Bobat, who's the um, hepatic clinician. Um, it is virtual, but uh, the um, the invitees are, are, are small. I think the aim is to keep it a small session. But I think if there are any dedicated hepatic pathologists that want to join, I'm sure um, Martin um, will be amenable to that. Thank you. And um, just remember too, that all these sessions are recorded and posted on the Gastro Foundation website. Um, all the se all the Gecko sessions are posted there every week. So you have um, the opportunity of going through them. Uh, 
apologies for this delay while um, Martin just looks at this frozen section. <clears throat> Well, we've got a very dedicated audience because we're not losing anyone at the moment. <laughs> we expected all these numbers just to drop off. Oh, it would be nice if you shared the frozen section. Um, frozen section slides. <laughs> um, yeah, I think is 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 more is more um, concerned about getting the report out <laughs> um, for the transplant surgeons. Uh, uh, okay, there's another. Um, another request for the virtual weekly show. I, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, I, don't, I don't believe it will be a problem for a few who are, who are dedicated and are interested, yeah. So I think just let us know, um, perhaps you can um, send your, your emails to Cheryl, uh, um, uh, Cheryl Valentine, who sends out the weekly Gecko invites. If you could just send us your name and your email and just mention they're interested in the weekly session, we can then see if we can add you. Um, and I see Bilal's also not on the session today. Um, We've got a question, Chris. What is the best Thank use you. of the in the 21st century? Right, what is the best use of biopsy? Um, well, look, the thing is with viral hepatitis, best use of biopsy, liver biopsy, the thing is with viral hepatitis, we don't need to biopsy livers anymore. And, and, and I think this is an important point that liver fibro scan is really, it's, it's, they're two important uses um, for liver, for, for a fibro scan. And that's um, uh, fatty liver disease, MAFLD, metabolic uh, associated dysfunction, fatty liver disease, and viral hepatitis. Um, so you get very good information. But rem remember, there are a host of other um, hepatic um, uh, liver conditions, which uh, liver scan really does not give you all the answers. And and the the, the I think the very important clinical um, scenario here as a patient who comes to you who has a high who has features of the metabolic syndrome um, and is drinking alcohol and is on a drug and and we're now with these patients and they have abnormal liver associated transaminases and you've done all the imaging there's no way you're going to be, be able to differentiate a fatty liver from the metabolic syndrome from that of alcohol and from that of a dilia drug induced liver toxicity and i think that's where liver biopsies are really important and um, enable you to differentiate what aspect of those three etiologies is contributing to the abnormal liver associated enzymes. Um, and then of course, there are a host of rare conditions that we pick up in clinical medicine uh, where you can only make, um, uh, make the diagnosis pathologically. One important chronic liver disease that concerns me a lot is also autoimmune chronic liver disease, where um, the, the liver transaminases really sometimes are, are really underestimate the degree of, um, of severity. And also patients with autoimmune liver disease that are on treatment, um, 
it's so important to normalize those enzymes because the, the, the process can really continue to deteriorate. And if you don't keep your eye on it pathologically, um, patients can slip into cirrhosis so quickly and also so subtly. So that's yeah, one condition well, where I think serial liver biopsies are important. Um, is there okay, um, tissue in the bottle? Can you bring that up, please? Thanks. Um, so there really is still a place for hepatic mm -hmm. pathology. Sorry, uh, Martin, we're just trying to fill in the, um, the space. <laughs> okay, right. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, so, Chris, can you... Um... Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see you. Thanks. Okay, right. Okay. So I'm sorry, this frozen section is going on. It's a little bit of a problem case. Uh, so, so I've got to be interrupted again. I've asked a few questions to come to me. So, um, yeah, so I was talking about the sponge. And um, if you think about it, when you, when you the liver is just like the sponge. So you have the reticulum framework, which is like the the, the structure of the sponge. You know, those little bits of yellow material, those plasticky sort of material that um, that you have in a sponge. And when you squeeze it, you squash all the air out. And the liver is exactly the same. And what happens is that um, the hepatocytes actually hold the reticulum framework apart. So when the hepatocytes die, then the reticulum collapses. So that's what you're seeing here. So this is an area here of regeneration. This is an area here where you've got collapse. And this is probably a central vein, for example. This um, is probably also central. Uh, whoops, I uh, can't I just think, keep on thinking it's a, a section that I can move. But really, all I'm really trying to show you in this slide is an area of regeneration. And the regeneration is now uh, keeping the, or separating the reticulum fibers again. It is a little bit disordered, but that will organize itself in due course. Whereas here, you've got the reticulum collapse, and that represents the, um, the foci of hepatocellular necrosis. Now, if a patient, for example, has massive necrosis or submassive necrosis of the liver, let's say it's a patient, for example, who has acute hepatitis A infection. As you know, hepatitis A is a, a less of a serious illness in, in children as compared to adults. Um, so uh, if this was an adult and the patient was watched and given supportive therapy, in fact, then what would happen is that the, um, is that the uh, liver would regenerate and you wouldn't know uh, any that the patient had been through this serious episode. So in other words, the liver can regenerate and could be completely normal. So in interface hepatitis, then, this is what we see. And here you've got a portal tract uh, here, let me just put the pointer on. Uh, put it on here. It's yellow. Not sure, but yellow. Yeah. Hmm. I'll wait, I'll wait for the, those questions, the answers to come back. Yeah, sure. Just hang on here, please. Okay, right. So interface hepatitis then is here. And you can see that the inflammatory infiltration is infiltrating into the parenchyma. And then what happens is that you start to see in chronic situations, you start to see fibrous tissue laid down. And this is what's happening here. So here you've got a portal tract. Here, I think there's another portal tract. I'm not sure about that, probably also portal. But what I want to demonstrate, sorry about this.
Okay, right. Sorry about that interruption. There's going to be another one as well. So I'll try and get through this as quickly as I can. So here you've got this bridging fibrosis or bridging reticulum collapse because of this uh, of this interface inflammatory activity. Right, and there's a more advanced example. And here you've got a portal tract, you've got another portal tract, and another portal tract. And here you can see much broader bands of fibrosis. And you've also got a more intense inflammatory infiltrate. And in fact, just looking at the intensity of this inflammatory infiltrate, it will probably do fairly well for something like autoimmune hepatitis, chronic autoimmune hepatitis. Here, this is the beginnings of architectural distortion. So we would call this an F3 fibrosis, but what you haven't got here is you haven't got complete circumscription of this regenerating nodule, so it's not a cirrhosis. So this would be equivalent to an F3 fibrosis. Fibrosis then ultimately, if it's long-standing, progresses to cirrhosis, and um, that happens because of stellate cell activation mm -hmm. in conjunction with cytokines. Uh, and in fact, you, what happens is that the stellate cells then lay down a different form of collagen, a different type of collagen. Remember, you've got type 1 to type 4 collagen, which uh, is present in, in the human body, and uh, you get stellate activation, stellate cell activation, and you get a rigid fibrosis, which is laid down in the sinusoids, which ultimately leads to cirrhosis. So that's what the liver looks like from a normal point of view. So remember that. This is the supermarket liver, and... Uh, that is a cirrhotic liver, and you can see a completely different, uh, completely different liver. So that's it, and I'm sorry about the interruptions, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, there were a few questions about um, the place of hepatic pathology and uh, what's the best use of biopsy in the 21st century. We also discussed issues like uh, Martin, you know, when um, liver scan, uh, fibro scans came out, there was this big concern that hepatic pathologists would become obsolete. And now we've got artificial intelligence and deep neural network and machine learning. How do you see artificial intelligence complementing uh, pathology or is it, uh, is it going to be a problem? So, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So if you look at machine learning and that sort of thing, I think the first thing is, somebody's got to teach the machine. Uh, and um, so, you, you know, it, it, there is evidence uh, that you can use artificial intelligence and scanning of, of sections to help aid uh, with the diagnosis. Um, and it has been used to discriminate, for example, in things like prostate cancer and, and so on. So there is probably a place for it, but I think... Uh, it's very much uh, in its infancy. Um, I doubt that um, uh, that histopathologists will be replaced. I think um, I think it is wishful thinking. Personally, uh, there have been many, many um, attempts over the decades, not the years, over the decades, to suggest that you know this is going to be the magic bullet. And I think that artificial intelligence will uh, will be go the same same route ultimately. And I think that uh, you know it's one thing to suggest that will it replace histopathologists. In fact, I think to the contrary, I think that potentially, in fact, what may happen is that there could be a replacement of physicians uh, by artificial intelligence. So I think that the whole practice of medicine, uh, not just um, not just histopathology, I think the whole practice of medicine will change. Yeah, interesting um, times. All right, Martin, I think it is uh, 1731, so yeah. I, I think we can call it an end and also release you from the session to concentrate on your the frozen sections. And thank you very much. It's been a particularly pressurized time for you, and we really yeah. appreciate your expertise. Um, there's also been uh, um, some requests to join the the Tuesday, the Wednesday two thirty um, pathology session, uh, which we will discuss uh, in sure. our, in our 
in our thank time. You. But thank you very much. We really appreciate this session. So that brings the session to a close. And thank you very much to the teams in New Mexico and in India, in Cape Town, and to the foundation for hosting it, and also uh, to the sponsors. And the, as I said, the, the meetings are recorded and also posted on the Gastro Foundation website weekly. And next week's session will be devoted to upper endoscopy. So thank you all for joining us and good afternoon to all. And again, Martin, thank you so much. <clears throat> Pleasure. Bye. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Bye then. <laughs>